Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to be with us today. We thank you, Lord. Ultimately, you have demonstrated the heart of a father to us. You blessed us even when we were in rebellion to you. You provide for us, Lord. You care for us. You had grace and mercy upon us to open our eyes. And so as we continue through Genesis, we ask that you would take this chapter and feed every heart that's here, every heart in the room, every heart that's listening. May we understand you more, Lord, who you are and how you love us. Bless the time we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 43, verse 13, take your brother and arise and go again unto the man. <clears throat> and God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your brother and Benjamin. And if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present and they took double money in their hand and Benjamin and they rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, bring these men home and slay and make ready for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade and the man brought the men into Joseph's house and they were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, are we brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our donkeys. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house, and said, O oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and we have brought it in again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food, verse 22, we cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And I brought, or sorry, and he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house, and they gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys provender. And then they made ready the present against Joseph as he came at noon, for they heard that he should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house, and they bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man, of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health, and he is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And the first dream was fulfilled. And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and he said, Is this your younger brother, of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn, deep emotion, upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber, and he wept there. And his employees had to be really confused, like, whew, whew, whew. You know, like, what, what is... And he washed his face and he went out and he refrained himself. That's an interesting word, to, to refrain or to restrain yourself from some sort of emotional outburst or to pull yourself back, the idea, keep yourself in control. We're going to hear that word three times today. He refrained himself and said, set on bread. And they set on for him by himself and for them, the eleven brothers, by themselves, and for the Egyptians which did, which did eat with him by themselves. And you're saying, well, why? Keep reading. Because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. And they sat before Joseph, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, again, roughly one in 40 million to get these guys in the exact order. And they marveled one at another. And he took and he sent portions of food, here in the old King James, messes unto them that were from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any others of theirs. And they drank and they were merry with him. And of course, Joseph studied them carefully to see if that extra portion and blessing to Benjamin invoked any jealousy on their behalf. He just watched to see how they would handle it. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. Now, why is he doing this? To test them. 
But the test has a twist. And put my cup, this silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, can be translated bowl or cup or pot, into the sack's mouth of the youngest. How many of you have a cup at home, your cup? Like, hey, that's my cup. No? In our house with all our kids, they each have a letter. For each have a different letter on it because we gave them each different names. And, you know, I've had different water cups, and some have been basically vases because I work in a basement office where I go up and down, up and down. So I have, and they always get broken, and I try to find another one. But, you know, a lot of people have their own. Hey, that's my cup. Not that I do that, but it's nice to have your cup. I, you know, I'll drink out of any cup. I'll drink out of a bowl. I'll drink out of anything. <laughs> in the middle of the night, I cut my hand, drink out of my hand. I mean, you know. We were, on, we were doing a wedding one time in the Dominican Republic, and, uh, and I was drinking out of my hand looking at the sink, and there's a little tile, and I finally got a chance to look at it, and it said, water is not potable. <laughs> Been a few days. Yeah, I had to get something for that. Anyway, his cup. Put my cup, <laughs> the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money, grain money, And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. And as soon as morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, literally, Ma, ma, which in Hebrew is what, what. So, for example, if you go to someone there in Israel and you say to him, you want to say, hey, what's up? You say, monishma. What is up? Or what? Monishma. And if you want to get even quicker than that, instead of saying monishma, you can just go, ma. So try it sometime. And then they'll speak back and you won't understand a word they said. But. <laughs> so here it's ma, ma. What, what? When it's repeated, the idea is, what, what, what have you done? Wherefore have you rewarded evil for good? That's what you're going to say to them. Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he, nokosh, is the word in the Hebrew, enchantment four times, divine two times, encounter one times, or enchanter, sorry, or diligently observe. Ancient writers tell us that the Egyptians would have a cup, they'd have something in it, and whether it was the metal of the cup, gold or silver, or jewels, or the con- contents of the cup, they would sit there and they would look at it and they felt they could divine or, in, in the sense, figure out future things that were coming by staring at these cups. So this is something noted by historians, and this is the idea of what's being said here. Take my cup, that claim that I used it to, and to divine. And you may or may not realize this, but some of you do it on Monday morning. You know, I just have M&Ms and water, but some of you people go and you get your coffee and you're looking at the coffee going, oh, this is going to be a bad week. I got all these meetings. And you kind of do the same thing, whether you know or not, looking at your coffee. But that's the idea of this cup that he would use. Among the Egyptians, this is known that they would try to soothsay or enchant or divine. So set them up and say, you've taken my special cup. And so the servant, verse 6, overtook them. Here they are just happy to finally get through the trial and get out of town. He overtook them and he spake unto them the same words. What, what? And you remember what he was told. Verse 7, and they said unto him, ma, ma, wherefore? Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this. You know, you Egyptians, man, we show up for food. You tell us we're spies. You tell us we're thieves. You tell us we're whatever. We come back. You tell us we're being, and then we leave, and you tell us we ripped you off. Seriously? It's all you people do to us. They didn't say all that. I'm just wondering if that was in their minds. They're like, what are you talking about? Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again. If we were really trying to rip you off, why would we bring that back? We brought it with us. And we gave it and brought it again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. So how then should we steal out of my Lord's house silver or gold? Verse 9. So, with whomsoever of thy servants it be found, let both let him die And we will also be my Lord's bondmen. Why do I think Reuben suggested that? Why is it that just fits his M.O.? You know what? Tell you what. You find it, whoever you find it with, he's dead, we'll be your slaves. You wonder if some of the others are like, what did he say? What what was that? (laughs) And Joseph's servant said, fine. Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant. And you should be blameless. 
And then they speedily took down, and they want to get this settled out quick, speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And the servant searched and began at the eldest, I love how they set this up, and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Now, why did Joseph put, once again, all their money in their sacks? Why did he do it the first time? What was he testing? It's an open book test, people. Come on. <laughs> their integrity. Are they still cool with illegal or illicit or ill-begotten gain? Are they, will they just, you know, gloss over that, come back like, we're here for more? So the second time it gets put in their sacks, the first time they know they didn't take it, they're not guilty, they're all in this together. Now, once again, they go away and they all have money again in their sacks. They know they didn't take it. They know they're not guilty. It was put there. What if he had put 11 of their monies in the sack and only given to Benjamin the cup? Then that would be a little harder for them because they'd be like, you know what? <laughs> no wonder he's a favorite. He's always stealing or whatever, you know. But by putting it in all 11 of their sacks again, the money, they all know we didn't take this. We're innocent. This is the second time this has happened to us. And of course, when it's found in Benjamin's sack, both money and cup, they know in their heart of hearts what? He's innocent. This is a setup. So it's an interesting way to test them. Well, it was found in Benjamin's sack. And they rent their clothes. A sign of grief or outrage. They laden every man his donkey and they returned to the city. And Joseph and his brethren came to or Judah, sorry, and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. Gee, wonder why he didn't go to work yet. <laughs> and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed, again, this is all through an interpreter, what deed is this that ye have done? What, that's old King James for no. What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine, and that's nakash, nakash, the word twice, enchantment, enchantment, divine, divine, enchanter, diligently observe. Know you not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? Or what shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? For God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Wait a minute, let's review. Uh, the first time they came to buy, did they steal their silver? No, but where did they find it? In their sacks. The second time they came to buy, did they steal their silver? No. Where did they find it? In their sacks. Did Benjamin steal that cup? No. Where did they find it? In their sacks. So what is he talking about? He's talking about them selling Joseph. It has nothing to do with the current charge. But they're basically saying, God is dealing with us now for a sin we've committed in the past. It's still fresh in their conscience. Judah said, what shall we speak? What shall we say unto my Lord? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. And here they're confessing their sin, <clears throat> which is not supposedly known to everybody in the room, but them, to the very one they sinned against to send them to Egypt that put them in the room with him. Everybody follow me? <clears throat> if all people to know, they're telling the guy they sinned against and sold that they have a sin that they've been hiding. Isn't that interesting? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. So behold, turn to Job chapter 1. We get emails and we pray for different things. And as this is all going down with this family, as we read here in Genesis, Job chapter one, by the way, Psalms go left. I got a prayer request from a person who asked us to pray for this regarding their family. They said, there is envy. How did these guys get into the trouble they are, these 10 brothers of Joseph? They envied Joseph. Why? Second thing on the prayer list, they said there is envy. Number two, jealousy. Why did they harm him? They were jealous of him. What were they jealous of? He was their father's favorite. Third thing this person asked us to pray for the family is they're dealing with greed. Greed. Why did they sell him? So they could make money. Why, why kill him? Let's make money. 
Fourth thing this family's asked for prayer for, pride. What kept them from admitting what they've done? Pride. Fifth thing they asked for in this prayer request, unforgiveness towards one another. That's a modern day prayer request. And every single attribute of it fits those 10 brothers of Joseph. You see, there's nothing new under the sun with families in trouble. It just manifests in different forms and technology makes it a little more complicated, but it's the same heart problem. But back to Job here, chapter one. Job chapter one, uh, verse six. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. That is the sons of God, literally the angelic realm. You'll need to know that to understand Genesis six, Beni Elohim, sons of God. They came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Whoa, 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 time out, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, yes. The devil's in the presence of God? Yes. But I thought Habakkuk said when he heard the Chaldeans were coming, aren't you of purer eyes than behold evil and have that to have evil within your presence, that be far from you? Remember that whole thing in Habakkuk where he's crying out about that? Yes. That's Habakkuk's opinion, responding to God. But here in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, we see Satan entering in, fallen, entering into the presence of God to challenge the Lord. Now, there is a time coming when Satan is thrown out of heaven. That's in Revelation 12. And when he's thrown out of heaven, he's cast down to the earth. And that period of time is the time of great tribulation when the devil has no more access to heaven. He's now locked out of it and down on earth. And he's going to go absolutely crazy against this world. But we're still in Job. The Lord said to Satan, verse 7, Once comest thou, and then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. Just like Peter warned us, a roaring lion, verse, chapter 5, verse 8, Peter. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered or studied my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth or departs away from evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thine hand and touch all that he hath and he will curse you to your face. And so the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in thy power only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And if you don't know what happened, you'll read it later. Chapter two. And again, there was a day when the sons of God, Beni Elohim, came to present themselves also before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And he answered, from, answered the Lord, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause? Here's our learning moment. Satan answered the Lord, having studied human history and human beings, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. He'll throw everything out the window to save himself. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but save his life. Satan is always under God's restraint. Anything allowed in your life, God has a reason for it. And it will only go as far as God allows. But we learn an important truth. It's all fun and games until your very existence is threatened. When your very existence is threatened, then suddenly you start playing by different rules. Satan knows that of the human realm. So back to Genesis. Judah said, verse 16, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and and also he with whom the cup is found. Now, they've just passed that first test. And I think, I wonder if Joseph was actually surprised, like, wow, wow, like, look at that. Uh, if they don't take grain home, who dies? Their wives, their children, and Jacob, their father. They're willing to risk all of them 
rather than bail on their brother. Have they changed? Yes. So another test. Joseph said, God forbid that I should, again through an interpreter, do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. As for you, get you up in peace, go. Go unto your father, you're free to go. My argument's only with him. Another test. And Judah came near unto Joseph. And he said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And this speech of Judah's is going to completely unhorse Joseph. Let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. I'm just a commoner and you're a king. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father Ahab loveth him. Joseph has now learned that in his absence, Benjamin became the new favorite. And thou saidst unto thy servants, verse 21, bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. So question, who is Judah pleading for? Benjamin? Or who is he really pleading for? Jacob. He's pleading on behalf of his dad. The lad cannot leave his father. If he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst, verse 23, unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up to thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, ye know that my wife bare me two sons. The one went out from me, and I said, Taroth, Taroth, tear, tear, tear in pieces or ravening. Surely he is twice used. Surely he is torn in pieces. Joseph just got another piece of information. Not only has it been said that he is dead, but now he finds out the story from which they deceived their father. He was torn in pieces. They brought some kind of evidence. So Jacob has lived with this idea his son suffered a vicious, horrible death alone. Surely he's torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. Turn to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Let's talk about another son. Torn in pieces. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Who is this quoted about? Jesus, Matthew 12. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretcheth them out. He that spreadeth forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth bread unto the people upon it and the spirit to them that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, his servant. And will lay hold, or will hold thy hand, and will keep thee and give thee his servant for a covenant. What did Jesus say the night he's betrayed? Take this cup, each of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. 
I will give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. And when that happens, here's what you look for. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass. New things do I declare, a coming covenant through one who will open the eyes of the blind. Behold, they spring forth. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So sing unto the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, and the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kadar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. Now that's the second coming. First coming we just covered, second coming. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Here's the Father's heart. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and, same word used of Joseph twice, refrained myself. God has kept himself back, kept himself in check and in control. When? When he sent his servant, whom they spit in his face, ripped out his beard, covered his head, beat him with a stick, said, prophesy who hit you, turn him over to the Romans who scourged him, jammed a crown of long thorns on his head, beat him also with a stick, mocked him, took him out and crucified him. And as they were nailing him and crucifying him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Why? They know not what they do. He was interceding for us. And he was taking what we deserve. He was the one willing to surrender himself to pull us out of slavery to sin. So Judah here is an interesting type of the ultimate descendant of the tribe of Judah through the line of David, the son of David, the Messiah, who will not break a bruised reed or extinguish a smoking flax, who will bear a covenant, and as he does it, open the eyes of the blind and will return. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and have refrained myself. It is a difficult thing to watch your child go through trouble. Around this time, 22 years ago, we learned our oldest daughter had a brain tumor. July 3rd was her surgery date. She's now a mother of two and a third coming. We were fortunate in that, one, it was figured out before it killed her. Two, it was operable. That's, if you don't know, if it's not operable, second thing, doesn't matter. Three, it wasn't cancerous. And we had a surgeon who heard the hearts of the parents, and that was, do everything you can to preserve our daughter. Some surgeons see it as victory if they get all the tumor, but leave the patient impaired. We were asking just by us time. Well, by the grace of God, it's never returned. She's alive and well. And what we went through compared to many families we've seen go through other things with their kids, it was really quite short. But one of the hardest things we had to do during that time, and it was July 3rd, is pick her up off of the gurney and hand her into the arms of the surgical team, not knowing if we'd see her again. As they beat his son, spit in his face, ripped out his beard, the father has been restraining himself because he so loved the world, you and I, that he was willing to let him step in in our place, bear our sins and the wrath they deserve. So that if you would actually come to the understanding that he so loved the world, if you believe upon him, he will dismiss your case and forgive your sin, that you could be back in fellowship and become a son or a daughter of God. That is how much God loves this world, that he will eventually have to judge. But that's how much he has loved this world to bring it away from that judgment. I have been still and refrained myself. Verse 14, I will cry like a travailing woman. I would destroy and devour at once the day of the Lord. 
I will make waste mountains and hills, dry up all their herbs. I will make the rivers islands. I will dry up the pools, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. And I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. They, have, they, they shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, that say to the molten images, you are our gods. Hear, ye deaf, and look, ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect and is blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Hearing the ears, but thou opening the ears, but thou heareth not. You're seeing and you're hearing, but you're not getting it. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled, Israel. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth, and for a spoil and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. So therefore he hath poured out upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it has set him on fire round about. Yet he knew not, and it burned him, and yet he laid it not to heart. But now, thus saith the Lord, that created thee, O Jacob, and that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. When thou through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, it shall not, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, thy Holy One, thy Savior. Even though he is judging them, he promises he will be with them. But back to Judah. Judah trying to get out of this mess. Verse 27. Thy servant my father said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons. The one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. Verse 29. And if you take this, Benjamin, also from me, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down the gray hairs, or my gray hairs, with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. You see, for 22 years they've watched Jacob mourn the loss of Joseph. And it was significant. And so Judah is able to understand, we lose another one, it'll be the end of him. For, my, for thy servant, verse 32, became surety for the lad, Benjamin, unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then shall I bear the blame. The word is chatar, and that is sin, purify, cleanse, or sinner. Then I will bear that sin. I shall bear the blame to my father forever. This from the mouth of the one who said, Hey, let's not kill him, let's sell him. Now he's saying, Take me. How many would say Judah has changed? Two hands. Boy, you're a tough crowd. <laughs> what we got here is a case of repentance. Real repentance needs no explanation. Real repentance is obvious. It doesn't need subtitles. You don't even have to be able to speak the language. When someone's really repentant of what they've done, they simply say, I owe you an apology. What I, done, what I have done was wrong. They own it. They don't say, I'm sorry, but. Oh, you've heard that. There's no more of this. It's, I was wrong. And not only do they own what they've done wrong and seek to apologize for it, but then they also seek to no longer do the behavior or thing that caused the pain in the first place. A really repentant person isn't just sorry, they're changed. And so it's obvious when it happens. Judah is willing now to take his brother's place. Now therefore I pray thee, verse 33, 
Let me, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman, to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father? Take me. The kingdom of Israel, how many have heard of King David? Good. How about King Solomon? Wonderful. King Solomon, at the end of his age, because of all the allegiances he made with foreign kings, married foreign wives, and he let them practice their foreign gods. And eventually, over time, they led Solomon's heart away from the Lord. So much so that Ahijah the prophet would come to one of Solomon's servants named Jeroboam. Jeroboam was wearing a brand new garment. Ahijah the prophet grabbed it, ripped it into 12 pieces, and gave Jeroboam 10. He said, Thus saith the Lord, because of the sins of Solomon and his household, I'm going to bring judgment against him. However, I will not do it in his days out of respect for my servant David. But when he passes and his son takes the throne, I'm going to divide the kingdom, ten and two. And sure enough, Rehoboam came to power. You can go read the account for yourself. But it divided into ten northern tribes, which in the Old Testament are referred to as Israel. And the two southern tribes, which are referred to commonly as Judah. But those two tribes that stuck together were Judah and Benjamin. And who do we have in this chapter surrendering himself to spare his brother? Judah surrendering it for Benjamin. Isn't that interesting? Just wanted to point that out. How shall I go home to my father if the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? And Joseph could not, third time we get this word, refrain himself, control himself, restrict back himself. Joseph could not refrain himself before all that stood by him. And he cried, obviously an Egyptian, cause every man to go out for me. Now remember, most of his servants don't know what's being said. Whoever's around the interpreter can hear it. So they're watching, you know, they're having this, this confrontation. These guys have been dragged back in, and they're there, and Judah's interacting with them personally. And Joseph finally, an Egyptian, says, out, everybody out. And they're all like, okay, this is different. What would you do? Awkward. You'd all leave, right? Like, we're out. We're so out of here. You don't have to say that twice. See ya. Boom, door shuts. Cause everyone to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brother. They had to be freaked out. Like, now what? Is he going to go postal? What? what, uh?" And he wept aloud, so loud, that the Egyptians literally of the house and of the house of Pharaoh heard it. So it was loud enough and long enough that everybody went, well, man, he's really crying, isn't he? And Joseph said unto his brethren, obviously in Hebrew, I am Joseph. And they had, uh, you know, like, what? What did he say? (laughs) I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer. In fact, I think they're glued to the back wall personally, just like, whoa. For they were troubled at his presence. Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And we're out of time. But at least I got you that far. Come on. I could have left you back at the other. Anyway, let's stand. Let's pray. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen.